Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to our webinar, first in our ser series of three detailed webinars on MC Squared, Managed Care, Managed Cost. Last year, you may recall that we had a series of four webinars on what is MC Squared and the result of that was a request for some more in-depth explanation of what some of this stuff is and how I would use it. So a year later, we've got three topics. The first is today's driver-based budgeting. Uh, two or three weeks, I'm not sure the date, is um, how to direct charge salaries and payroll, and if you can't, how do I do activity-based costing? And the third is how would I use contract management or job costing to get more detailed information on um, individuals that we serve or programs that we're running. Um, so let's jump right into driver-based budgeting. Why budget at all? I think this is the answer. So we can worry before we spend money as well as afterwards. Hopefully if we worry before we spend it, we may not spend it and we won't have to worry about it. So where does budgeting fall in our MC squared um, set of boxes? Those four colored boxes at the bottom represent the four phases in our estimation of what you need to do to manage care and manage costs. The first, whoops, wrong button, the first being to identify and control your costs. Budgeting has got a big part of that. What are the costs I'm trying to identify and, and manage? And at the very end of the process, monitoring and following up that I am actually um, managing those costs. And in the middle, the two in the middle are to, um, what are the two in the middle? The two in the middle are to optimize performance, that's the second one, and the third one is organizational change. How do I physically make changes in my organization and outside my organization to accomplish this? Okay. Um, by the way, we will, at the end of the session this afternoon, we'll send you the slides. We have your email address because you're registered for the webinar, so we'll email the slide deck out this afternoon in PDF format if you want copies of that. So what do I want to accomplish in the next 55 minutes? Um, two basic things. One is I want to convince you that there's value to having a driver-based budget, an operational budget. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. And then I want to show you actually how to do it, what things, what steps you'll need to go through to accomplish it. Show you some examples, allow you to ask questions. It's about all we can do. After that, you've got to do it yourself. Um, if you have questions that you want to ask, on your screen on the right-hand side in GoToWebinar, there's a panel. And if the panel is not visible, there's a little tiny panel with a red arrow at the top. You can click that red arrow. It will expand the panel. And you'll see a place where it says questions. And you just type your question in. I'll see it on my studio monitor, and I can read the question and answer your, your hopefully provide you an answer to what that is. Um, so I will use in interchangeably the words budgeting and planning. Um, what we want to, the point I want to make is that budgeting is not simply a compliance requirement that accountants demand to see because accountants have nothing better to do. Uh, the point of budgeting is to plan something and execute that plan effectively and know that you have succeeded or failed at the end. So the, you've got to put some thought and some um, effort into a meaningful budget. It doesn't mean it has to be terribly complicated. It doesn't mean it's got to be really hard to do. It doesn't mean you have to spend days and days and days and days and days doing it. It means you have to think about what do I want to accomplish and how will I get there. Um, if you don't know where you're going, any road will certainly get you there. Um, there's an example of maps. Some of you, if you're old enough, will remember maps. You used to get them at the Texaco station. They were free. Um, and you could unfold the map and see where you were going. And if you want to go to Arizona to visit 
your aunt because it's her 90th birthday, you got yourself a US map, this one shows the interstate highways clearly labeled, and away you go. This, in my opinion, is very similar to how many agencies do budgeting today. Is I got a generic plan. I'm going somewhere west. And I might go through Chicago, I might go through Kansas City, I might go through New Orleans, I might stop in Memphis on the way, but I'm going that way. Um, the problem, if, if you're old enough, like I am, to remember in fourth grade, they taught you how to read a map. What interstate signs looked like, what, um, which ones were double roads, double carriageways, etc. So the problem with map is you have to know how to read it, number one. Same with budgeting. If you're not a trained accountant, you may not understand how a budget is being presented. So if you don't understand how a budget is being presented, how is it going to get you where you want to go? I distinctly remember riding in the back seat of the car and my father telling my mother, you need to turn the map upside down so you can tell which way you're going. And my mother said, that's ridiculous. So if you don't know how to read the thing, you're not going to get anywhere with it. Secondly, as you can see from this map, it's very, very, very high level. It's hard to tell what's happening round about St. Louis by looking at this map. I'm not even sure St. Louis is on this map. It only has capitals of the states. So, limited information, but nonetheless a map that will get you there. Our next door neighbors here in Williamsville, the AAA, invented this great thing called the triptych. Again, if you're old enough, you'll remember this. And what it was is literally the map cut up in strips and you only saw the strips that were relevant to your trip and they took a blue marker as in this example and highlighted follow this particular road and it will get you where you want to go. I think for an extra 10 bucks they would actually circle where the construction was. So that's a better answer to a road trip plan. It's specific it's readable, you don't even have to understand it, you just gotta follow the line, and it kind of generally tells you where to look out and where to be um, concerned in your trip. Today, of course, in the 21st century, we all have Tom Toms, or Magellans, or whatever, which tells you in 20 feet turn right, you will be at the restaurant in two hours and three minutes very specific, very directional, um, immediate feedback as to what you should be doing now, what you will be doing tomorrow, etc. This is where you want to be with your budgeting. You want it to guide you through the pitfalls, the roads, the travels that your organization is going through wherever possible. So a trip tick is better than a map and a TomTom -tom is better, sorry AAA, than a triptych. Um, and that's what we want to do is move you as an organization from the map kind of generic, high level, hard to read, hard to understand budget to what do I do today. So if you think about your budgeting currently in your organization, if you're doing this, um, you may be doing budgeting at the agency level you may well have budgets and budget reports down to the department, the division, the program level. There may be a residential budget, there may be a clinical budget, there may actually be a budget for, an, for each individual IRA. Um, I, it's up to you. I'm not, we're not, I'm not concerned about how far down you go, but the concept is you'll see a budget that probably has um, conceptually this in it. A bunch of stuff in red on this pie chart that you can't control and a relatively small piece that you can. And that includes things like allocations and fringe benefits and all sorts of things that get added into the bottom line for which you're going to be asked, explain this. Um, often that's as far as the budget goes is I don't understand what you're asking me. You're asking me things that I don't have control over, I can't explain it, 
I will explain it, but it's a meaningless explanation, and budgeting is now finished because nobody believes it, nobody trusts it, there's no reason to put any effort into it. I would argue that your budget should be something different. We want a difference between accounting, which we're describing, I'm sitting, standing here looking at a room full of accountants, so if you start to see things flying into the camera at me, it's because um, we don't necessarily want to do what the accountants want. Um, that's accounting. That's a required statutory thing. What we're looking for in MC squared is accountability. How can I account, how can I trust you as a program director, as a manager, as a fiscal manager to say, I will take personal responsibility for lowering this cost or managing this thing and it's my plan. So we want personal accountability as part of the planning process, as part of the budgeting process, not just accounting. So what we'd like to see is a world that looks closer to this pie chart, and that is a fairly big chunk, although not 50%, either, or maybe more than 50%, whatever, a big chunk that says these are the things that you can control and you understand and you can explain. That's the stuff in blue. Uh, then there's a bunch of stuff in this particular chart on, in red, hopefully a very little piece, that you can't control, maybe nobody can control. An example of that is, you, we're not for profit, so we don't have this issue, but in the real world of for profit, there's taxation. So I can't control taxes. So you can plan for them by saying, I'm gonna write down what I think they're gonna be, but if they change, they change, and there's nothing you can do about it. So we wanna ideally minimize the amount that's not controllable, but certainly if it's not controllable, we don't wanna waste a lot of time trying to explain why I can't control it. Just accept it and move on. The green, in this case, is stuff that can be controlled, but not by you. And so the point here is if that's on your budget and you're being asked to explain it, it probably means it's not on the budget of the person who does have to explain it and therefore we're not getting a meaningful explanation. The people who can justify it don't see it, the people who do see it can't explain it, and it becomes an unexplainable or uncontrollable cost. And that's that's going to lead to waste, that's going to lead to all sorts of problems. So what we want to do is, is get through this process where we're increasing what we can control, identifying who can control it, getting them to control it, and minimizing what we think is out of our scope. Here's a really big, long, long text slide, um, which I don't think I'll read all the way through, but this came from somewhere, it may well have come from Wikipedia, as an explanation of what is budgeting. Um, the things I've highlighted in red is what I would like to, to highlight today. Consider how conditions might change. So making a budget that says, well, this year I spent uh, 100,000 on salaries, so I think next year I'll spend 101, doesn't do it. I need to say, I think minimum wage is gonna go up in New York State, um, that's going to drive our um, salary questions. We may need to raise our salaries significantly. Um, we, may not, we may have people leaving, which may force overtime. There's all sorts of things that you want to consider what might change. It doesn't mean you have to have a crystal ball and you have to, uh, you have to know what's happening. It means you should think about what's reasonable. You want to be considering problems before they arise. We don't want to be shocked and stunned if the legislature passes into law a $15 minimum wage. We don't, we don't want to be surprised by that. We may be unhappy with it, we may be whatever, but we shouldn't certainly be surprised by it. And third, we want to identify which relationships exist between my department and other departments that affect me. So, for example, IT. 
if the IT department can't hire qualified, trained people to be the help desk, and I'm the one that uses the help desk, and I call the help desk and I get a wrong answer, and that results in my having to do the work again, that's a thing that's going to affect me. So that doesn't mean I can dictate who a IT hires, but I want to be aware of their issues, if those issues affect me. So, um, so I can plan for alternative ways of doing it, whatever it happens to be. Okay? So um, when you get these, um, the slides emailed to you, you'll be able to read this in detail and study it and highlight it and underline it and all the sorts of things you might want to do with this slide. I would dare say this is probably um, something like what you would see in a budget if you got a budget report. Um, this is not even a, a not-for-profit agency. I think this is a law firm, but it doesn't really matter. Um, you can see there's a whole long list of expenses in the first column. There's an actual year-to-date column. This, the first column of numbers is how much have I actually spent so far in April. The third column is how much have I budgeted for the entire year. And the fourth column is what do I got left to spend? So it's like on the Wheel of Fortune when you buy all the stuff and you take what's left on a gift certificate, right? So you've spent what you're going to spend, and then at the end, I can afford to spend another $40,000 in occupancy. So let's move into a mansion. I got a lot of extra money. Well, that you're not focusing on the fact that I still got six, ten, eight months, do the math here, eight months left in the year that needs to come out of that $40,000. So if it costs me $11,000 for January, February, March, and April for occupancy, then I'm using occupancy at the rate of about $2,600 a month, and I got eight more months to go, it looks like I might be pretty good. But you can see that if you, don't, if you don't know what you're looking at and you don't do this calculation, you can't really tell, is, am I good or am I not good? Okay? Another one you might see, this is the kind of thing that makes accountants drool, is just numbers from side to side on the paper. What do I do now? So this is the same business, same expense lines, but now I'm saying, what did you do for the particular month of October versus what you thought you'd do in October? And am I overspent or underspent? And is that, if I am overspent, it's in red. And the next three columns are year to date, so it's the whole year. And just at a glance, you can see there's a lot of red on this page. So this is kind of like a triptych. It's getting closer to, I can see because of the blue line drawn in there, I need to start worrying because there's a lot of red. But it's still pretty complicated to read um, and understand what you're talking about. So let's go back and take the first one and use this um, idea of what can I control, what can't I control, and what do I do about it. So if this was your divisional budget or your program budget, you might, I might see by looking at it that I have a line for depreciation slash amortization. So there's actually a difference between depreciation and amortization, and you have to go to school for five years now to find out what it is, but trust me, it's accountants concerned with it, not you. Secondly, you got information systems, IT. So what is that? Is that software that you bought? Is that computers that you use? Is that your internet connection? Is that the cost that you're being charged by the IT department for help desk? I don't know what that is. Fringe benefits. Presumably, fringe benefits are determined by the HR department and in human resource policies. So you're gonna hire people you're going to determine your needs and the skill sets of employees that you're looking for, but the fringe benefits are something that's going to be decided by somebody else. So you don't really have control. I would like to hire 
Four more people, but I would not like to pay fringe benefits, please. Not likely to happen. So, why wouldn't the accounting department explain away the depreciation? Because it could be good and it could be bad. There is a variance there. I just don't know what it is. Likewise in IT, likewise in HR. Why wouldn't I literally take those lines off of the budget, put them on those other departmental budgets? So, if you have budgets that look like the blue boxes today, the IT department has a budget, your department has a budget, the HR department has a budget. Why not? So everything that's currently on the, H, the IT department's budget on the left would now, directly below it, appear on the IT's accountability plan. So this is the things that they are responsible for. But they're also responsible for some things that are in your budget, namely that line called information services. So let's take it off of your blue budget and put it on their green budget. Some of the things are going to stay on your green budget and some of the things are going to come off your blue budget and go on to the HR department's green budget. And what, what we're going to end up with is what's on your green budget is what you need to explain. Those are the things that we've identified that you're responsible for. And the stuff that's on your blue budget may well still exist because the accountants need to have that and certain rules apply that say, I want to see a budget in a certain standard format. I'm not saying take the blue ones away. Why not make another set of budgets that are green ones that have those um, accountable things? So what's control? And then there'll be things that appear on a blue budget and aren't on anybody's green budget because they're not controllable. It doesn't mean they, that doesn't mean we're ignoring them. They appear on the blue budget, they appear in our reports, but there's no reason to beat anybody up over them. And so the green budgets are going to be shorter. They can be simpler and you need to explain them. That's the concept of, of accountability versus accounting. The blue budgets are accounting, the green ones are accountability. So I want to be real clear about what I'm proposing here, because you're going to, sitting in, at, in your office there, chomping on your sandwich, listening to this, you're going to say, did he just say we should have two budgets? Yes, that's what I just said. You should have two budgets. Your organization may have two, three, four, five different budgets. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go through the budget process in October five different times. I'm saying you go through the budget process and you produce five different, very different looking reports depending on who gets that report and what I expect them to do with it. So you may have multiple budget reports, the same dollar amounts appear, but they're grouped differently. So I see on my budget the things I'm responsible for. You see on your budget the things you're responsible for, and both of those things appear on the master budget somewhere. But the point is we want to make, we're, we're trying to go from a generic, high-level, hard-to-read document like a U.S. map down to at least a triptych, if not a tom-tom, that says, this is what you need to do this week. Okay? Operational budgets or plans are going to drive your decisions and actions, and compliance budgets are things that you have to have because God invented accounting and says you have to have this. So what we want to do is understand what it's going to cost. So budgeting tells us that. We want to know why it's going to cost that. And we want to know why when that doesn't happen. That's also important. So we need to get you as a direct frontline manager, you've got to understand what it, what it means to get there, and you've got to have some buy-in that this is going to work. So. You all probably know the best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So we're going to go through, how am I going to do this step by step into this process? So, for each specific cost, so what I'm assuming now is you've 
erased, you've crossed off on your budget all the things that you're not responsible for. Okay? We're talking just about your controllable costs. How will you budget them now? Take each line. First line, identify what are the drivers that make this line work. And I'll explain that in a minute. What time period am I budgeting? Typically we're talking about a year broken up into 12 months. I don't know how many agencies are actually budgeting for a week or a day or anything like that. But assuming it's going to be a month, you might have a, one that runs a calendar year and runs one that runs a school year, but you gotta, you got to figure that part into your plan. Then you're, you're going to estimate how many of these things I'm going to have. Again, I'll explain that in a minute. How much do I think it's going to cost for each one? I'm going to write this down. This is my budget. I think I'm going to have 20 of these and each one's $5.00. My budget's a hundred bucks. Okay? Now time passes. And I get a report with my budget what I actually spent. And I actually use twelve and they cost me sixteen dollars a piece. And I don't know how to do that math, but it's gonna be a lot more than the twenty that I planned. You need to explain two things. Why did you use twelve and not ten? And why did they cost sixteen and not five? But presumably, you can answer both of those questions because you know that those things drive the budget. Okay? So you can explain it in your report and you can justify it. It's either, sorry, that's what happened and I'll do better next time, or I think we need to change something to fix the problem. So, but at the very least, what we're going to get is an understanding of how I got there, why I spent it, and hopefully a plan to correct. So that on a tom-tom, -tom, it's going to tell you, turn left, turn left, and then you turn right. And then it's going to say, recalculating, recalculating, turn right at next possible right. So it's going to try and put you back on track. So that's what we're talking about here is, hopefully it's going to help keep you on track, but if you go off, you're going to understand why and be able to recreate the plan. Okay, so what are drivers? Drivers are facts, statistics, events that show how much will be spent. They should be expressed as a number. They'll be part of a formula. You could have multiple drivers that drive something. Here's an example, um, electricity. Um, when you get your electrical bill, it says on it, you used 17 kilowatt hours. And last year, same month, you used 10 kilowatt hours. So you used almost twice as much electricity as you used last year. That means something, not just, oh, my electric bill's higher. You can see, it doesn't tell you that you need to go out and unplug the pool filter that's been running 24 seven for the last month, but you know you've used more electricity. Rates are how much it cost for that driver. So, if you can at least understand what the driver is, and you know what the rate is, you can multiply it together. You've got to make some guesses. Budgeting is guessing. Budgeting is not knowing. If you knew the answer, you could produce the actuals in advance. Right? That was the whole concept of Back to the Future, which, by the way, I guess tomorrow is the day. In the movie Back to the Future 2, they go forward to October the 21st, 2015, which is tomorrow. So all the, all the things will come true tomorrow. Um, but if you knew, as it says in the movie, that the Cubs are going to win the World Series in 2015, you can go out and bet, right? Although the Mets are probably going to take care of that for you. Um, so they're assumptions, they're guesses. There's nothing wrong with guessing wrong. You got to try and educate your guess. You got to have an idea that this is an intelligent estimate, not just a random guess. But if you guess wrong or circumstances change, you have to say, I'm going to change it. I'll, I'll adjust. And then I will try again. That's what happens when you turn right, when the Tom Tom or the Garmin or the Magellan tells you to turn left. 
you got to recalibrate. Okay? So your budget then is your driver times your rate applied to a period of time. So let's use a, a more detailed example. Let's say your budget has a line that says utilities. Now, if you're in a residential organization, if you're in an IRA, you have some control over your utilities, just like you do in your home. If you're in a program department that's part of a corporate office building, your utility allocation probably doesn't have anything to do with what you're doing. I mean, you don't even turn the lights on. The lights are on when you come in. They get turned off by the cleaning people at night. The heat is in a thermostat that's got a lock on it. You can't control it. So utilities are still there. There's still a cost, but you can't control it. So there's no point in you explaining it. But if I'm in a residential area, I want you to control utilities. Problem is, utilities is too generic a term. I don't know what that means. I don't know how to explain it. So let's break it down into natural gas. Sold by the cube, by 100 cubic feet, I think, if you look at feet. 100 cubic feet, if you look at the bill. You use it for your hot water heat. Um, the number of people that live in your residence, if you've got 10 versus 5, you're probably going to use more gas because you're going to use more hot water. Electric is sold by the kilowatt hour. It's used for light. Appliances, air conditioning in the summer, if you have it, it's affected by the number of people. Water, cable, and internet, if you have that in your, in your building. So those, I would first argue that if you've got a controllable cost, like utilities, you need to break it down into more detail. That things that you can explain. Because if my utilities are flat, one month to the next, it could be because I use way too much gas and not enough electric for some reason. And if I'd known that, I could have used less gas and I would have had a reduction in my cost rather than flat. That's what I want to know. That's what we need you to know. So here's an example of an uh, electric bill and a gas bill. If it's a residential, you get national fuel or national grid, that's what they look like. And you'll see for the last 13 rolling months how many um, units you've used. And you can see in the um, electric bill on the right that in September the usage was another, looks like 20, 25% higher than it was the same September last year. That's nothing to do with the electric company raised their rates. More electricity was used. Why? It's not good enough to just say, I don't know, it's just electric bill. You used it. Somebody used it. What's happening? What am I going to do to fix it? Okay? So in a residential area, you can control it. In an office setting, you may not be able to control it. So I would argue, in this example, that you get a report, a budget report, that looks something like this. An operational budget. Direct care hours, direct care overtime hours, nursing hours, gas usage, electric usage. So here's an example of what you might currently see as two lines on your budget, salaries and utilities, broken into five different lines. So you got more lines, but each line makes, hopefully, makes sense to you. You can see that in my direct care hours, I used 24 hours this month, less than I thought. But I used exactly 24 hours in overtime, which, by the way, costs me more than direct care regular hours. But it, so what do I interpret from that? I interpret from that I have a scheduling problem. Someone who I wanted to work a shift didn't come in and I had to get someone to cover that shift at overtime rates. So now at least I can identify there's a problem here. If you looked at salaries and you saw 
direct care regular, direct care overtime, and nurses hours all added together in a single line, you can see because our nurse hours are well under plan, I would show, my budget would show me I'm actually doing pretty good from a salary's perspective, which is true, but it hides the fact that I have a scheduling problem causing me to spend overtime. So what we want to see is show the details, see where it comes up, and you can say, regardless of the dollars, you can say, I get the hours. I get what 300, 736 hours is in my IRA. I get what eight hours is, that's one shift in my IRA. I get what my nursing hours, I know what that stuff means. I can tell how much gas I think I should be using based on historical usage. I can tell how much electricity I should be using, and I can see what's happening. And if you got a budget like this, you could explain it and better yet act upon it to make it better. So use another example, salaries. I show you, showed you in that example an ex um, some more detail, but salaries in most of your organizations is going to be the single largest expense. So you certainly want to look at this if you can um, take care of it. So separate out the different kinds of salaries. If I, get some, if I have somebody who's salaried, i.e. exempt, not paid for the number of hours that they work, then I want to know that because multiplying the number of hours they work is irrelevant. It doesn't matter to me. So I want it separate. I don't want to say I've got 10 hours at, um, and that costs $100 and I see at the end of the month that I used 20 hours and it was still $100. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, the reason was that those extra 10 hours were on an exempt employee and they didn't get, you didn't pay for that. So you want to separate from a salary perspective, hourly from non-hourly. You probably want to separate out overtime hours. And the reason is, even though they're hours, they are at a different rate. You're paying time and a half, or you're paying double time, or you're paying triple time if you're in the union and it's Christmas Eve. Um, so you want to separate out things that have unique characteristics or have their own rate so that you can easily multiply that stuff out. So an example here, you might say, I want to know all the day shift hours in my IRA. Okay, there's 31 days in this month and every day has a day and every day has a night and every day has an evening. So I got 31 day shifts at eight hours each, I got 31 evening shifts at eight hours each, and I got 31 night shifts at eight hours each. Or I might want to say, wait a minute, I pay extra if you work the weekend. Okay, so now it's not 31 day shifts, it's 20 day shifts and 10 weekend day shifts and one holiday. That's different. And if I find that I incur my overtime because my employee decided not to come in on the holiday, that's a different answer than I have a scheduling problem. I have a personnel problem. So if you, if you know what you're looking for, and I would dare say that in many of your residences, you're already tracking these hours. You're already planning these hours. You're already scheduling these hours. They just don't bear any relationship to what you know as the budget. So the driver, what I'm talking about, the driver in this case is hours. What kind of hours? Daytime, weekday hours. And how many of those am I going to have? And what is my rate for that? Multiply it all out. That becomes my salary budget. I turn that into fiscal. They put it on my report, okay? So um, if you have salaries that come from another department, like you're using um, physical therapists and you have to have them come to your residence and provide something, who's budgeting that time? The answer to the question is it should be you that's budgeting that time, 
not them. Because you're the one that's responsible for that. If, if they send a physical therapist to your residence and that day the individual's not there for whatever reason, are you going to get charged for that? Perhaps. Why? Because you didn't cancel. That's your responsibility. So you want to pay for, you want to budget those kinds of expenses. What about IT? I would argue IT is not something that you budget because you don't have any control over whether that computer breaks or doesn't break and how long it's going to take IT to fix it. That's their responsibility. And they balance the decision, I'm going to keep old computers around because I don't want to spend the money on new ones and I'm going to incur the repair cost to keep them running. That's not your decision, that's their decision. They should budget that. So you really got to think through these things. The good news is you don't have to think through these things every day. You do it once when you create the budget. You identify, this is controllable, this is not controllable. This is controllable by IT, this is controllable by me. This is controllable by HR, this is controllable by me. You identify that stuff, and unless you incur a new kind of expense in the coming year, you don't have to do that again. All you have to do is go through and say, what are my plans for the coming year? And I would argue that it's going to be easier for you to say what are my plans in the coming year in terms of how many day shift, weekday hours I'm going to spend than to say with accuracy, what's my salary expense. Okay? So what you're doing is you're, we're taking the budget down to the turn-by-turn -turn level, asking you to decide how you're going to get there, and then just like you can on your Garmin or your TomTom, there's a button that zooms back. You can actually zoom all the way back and see that US map if you wanted to. It's going to be really tiny, but you're going to be able to see that. So you're, you're building the, date, the budget from the ground up in a way you can explain it and understand it. Why wouldn't you do this? What's going to get in the way? Why haven't you already done this? All good questions. First thing is getting management fiscal, whoever, to buy in to the concept that there should be two budgets. And I'm, again, I'm not saying we have two different sets of numbers. I'm saying we have one set of budgeted numbers with on two different kinds of reports for two different kinds of users. So you've got to have an, you've got to take this to the very top, senior leadership, and explain if I had a budget that I could understand of items that I can control and is measured on activities that I actually direct, I'd be willing to say, I stand by that budget. I've, I've got more confidence in this budget saying 100000 in salaries than last year's budget that I didn't understand where that came from. Okay? So, there... There's a value, in our opinion, in our MC squared model, to knowing these details and providing that feedback. What, you, what may take a little work initially is a consensus on what the key drivers are going to be. So, as I described in residential, you may or may not agree with me that I'm going to measure week weekday daytime shift hours differently than weekend daytime shift hours. I don't care. You do that. That's, your, that's what you got to do. And you could have, if you've got 25 IRAs, the, you could have 15 IRA managers saying one thing and the other 10 saying another thing and you got to have a fight and decide how it's going to be. But once you do that, once you agree to a consensus, you should, you should have it. I would hope, I would argue, that if you're managing your residential program well, you're already defined these kinds of drivers for all your IRAs, so that they're not all renegade IRAs doing whatever they want. They're following a set of rules that you've already created. You're just using those rules to be part of the budget. A real difficult thing could be, how do I capture those quantities? So let's say I want to get down to managing daytime shift weekday hours. How do I find out what that number is? 
I mean, you can guess. You can look at the calendar and multiply out your budget. How do I see the actuals? Does that mean when people fill out their timesheet, they have to enter on the timesheet that it was a Thursday during the day that I did this? Perhaps. Um, there's a, the next webinar that we'll be doing is on direct charging um, salary costs, and we'll talk more about that then. But if you've got a, um, any kind of a payroll system, the payroll system can generate a report that knows that October the 20th is a Tuesday, and that's a weekday, and it's not a holiday, and you just need to know what shift the person worked, and you probably already are capturing that for salary rate reasons. So my argument is, if you looked at your payroll system in detail, not your general ledger, but your payroll system, you could probably answer those our questions fairly straightforwardly whether you're using ADP or some other service or you've got your own payroll system, I think you could get, without a whole lot of effort, those, that information. Where do I put it, though? Once I know my budget hours and my actual hours, how do I put them someplace so that I can see them side by side on my report? Well, the logical place to put that is in your general ledger because the general ledger is where you're doing all this reporting. And that's suggesting you need to go out and buy a new budgeting system. You use your general ledger to store this information. And you can do it in one of two ways. Some general ledger systems, like um, Dynamics, GP, great, formerly known as Great Plains, um, Sage 300, formerly known as ACPAC, Sage 100, formerly known as Mass 90, these kind of systems will have quantities in their general ledger. So you'd be able to make a journal entry to your general ledger that includes a quantity. There's literally three columns in the GL, debits, credits, and quantities. And you could book a journal entry every month by the number of hours in that area. If you don't, if you've got a smaller system, if you're using something like QuickBooks or um, Peachtree, now called Sage 50, or um, uh, FundEZ, or one of these um, less expensive, less complex systems, they probably won't support quantities. So the way to, you do it is to identify an account number, make an account number that will be a statistical account so that the quantities are stored as debits and you just know that they're not dollars because the account number says statistical, okay? So you, you can record the, the quantities then just as exactly as you would record any budget. And then every month you get a journal entry and you book that journal entry for not only the dollars but the quantities. If you've got a payroll system and you're importing that information from ADP, you get ADP to modify that import and the file comes over with quantities and dollars. Okay? You can produce multiple specific reports then. You could produce a report that only has the day shift hours and give it to the day shift manager and say, explain this to me. You can get the weekend hours and get the weekend manager to explain this to you. And you take that information and you explain it to the residential manager who explains it to the controller who says we're, all, we're over budget but we know why and this is what we're working on to fix it. Okay? So those general ledger statistical, so if you've got account number 700 and that's currently called salaries, I would make a 701 called exempt salaries, one called 702 direct care daytime salaries, 703 direct care weekend salaries. And I see the look on all the auditors' faces in this room saying, oh my God, how am I going to audit all these accounts? When the auditors come in, you roll them together on a report and say it's salaries. Computers can add numbers up easily, can't break numbers apart quite so easily. So recording information in detail and adding it up 
solves the auditor's problems, solves anybody's problem that wants to see less information. Then I would go back and make another account. If 702 is my account for daytime, day shift, residential, direct care salaries, I would make an S702. Most of your general ledger systems will, will support alphanumeric account numbers. Make an S702, and in there you're going to record the hours. Then when you produce your financial statements, you just don't print the S's, and you'll get what you've always gotten. But if you want to know the hours, you show me the S's. And if I want to produce a budget report for operational purposes, I'm going to have one column. The, the line is going to be 702. This is going to be the account that has S in it. And this is going to be the one that doesn't have S in it. And this is going to be last month. And this is going to be this month. And this is going to be year to date. And all those things that you already have in your financial statements all work. And you have budgets of quantities, drivers, side by side with the dollars. A couple of tricks if you're going to make a statistical account. You need to make them balance sheet accounts. Okay, Balance sheet accounts are, they just sit there. This is accounting 101. You don't need to worry about balance sheet accounts. They just sit there. They don't, you don't have to worry about them getting included in your revenue or, or expense. You don't have to worry about them closing, and if you don't know what closing means, it doesn't matter. If you do know what, what closing means, you don't have to worry about it because they're balance sheet accounts. What you would have to do, however, is because we've had double entry accounting since the year 1200, if you put an entry in S702 for 10 hours, you got to put an offset somewhere. So I would have an account called S, 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 and in there, you would dump your offset. So if, you're, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's fine. If you're an accountant, you should know what I'm talking about. And you're balancing your statistical entry so that your system's not out of balance. But your, those accounts are logically way at the bottom of the chart of accounts and not included in your financial statement reporting. Um, so hopefully that makes some sense as to why you would do that. So our... our um, Recap, what we want to accomplish is we want to move, I found this, this graphic, um, from crawling like an ape to walking upright. And you, we're probably, most of your um, organizations, I would argue, are probably at incremental budgeting. And that means you're taking last year's budget and incrementing it by 3% or 2%. And calling it next year's budget and we press on and that's what you're doing we want to move forward to a better more meaningful budgeting process zero based budgeting is every year I start with a blank piece of paper and invent a budget it's a better answer than incremental budgeting because it forces you to plan what you're going to do um, what we're talking about is driver-based budgeting, which is very similar to that. It's not just a blank sheet of paper, it's a series of drivers, assumptions, and rates that says, this is how I'm going to get from where I am to what my budget is. What we're trying to accomplish is results-based budgeting. And that is, I can ask you as the department head who's responsible, why are we not on budget? And I would expect a result because you can no longer say, I don't know what the budget means, I don't know where you got these numbers from, this stuff is not under my control, we've resolved all those issues. So go out and manage your IRA within your budget. That's results-based budgeting. And our dream, and in fact the goal of managed care, is priority-based budgeting. The priorities that I'm uh, balancing against my budget are outcomes that my individuals have in their plans of care. So 
if you're going to say I need to increase or reduce my costs or change my plan of care in a managed care environment, you're juggling the costs and the revenues are staying the same. So you're going to need to know where these costs come from and how they come about so that you can make effective decisions on how they're affected by this change in priority. So that's the goal. What we talked about today doesn't get us there. It gets us almost there. We're still walking with a spear. But we're hoping that that's, that's the start of a year from now, you'll have budgets that are understood, justifiable, and managed, and then can be addressed on an individual basis or program basis in terms of priorities. Okay? That's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? No one has asked a question. Certainly someone must have a question. We've got like three minutes that I can answer any questions. If you want to type them in the questionnaire department, I can answer them. Um, if not, I'll, I'll give you a few minutes to type. Um, if you click on the red arrow in the upper right hand corner, it will expand that uh, window and there's a tab that says questions and you can type in there. Um, if not, we will this afternoon send you a PDF of the um, slides. Um, we've covered a lot. Um, so there's some detail here that you may want to go back and study those slides. Um, if you have any questions about what I'm talking about or how do I know if my general ledger has quantities or um, I really can't figure out how to add more account numbers because it'll make my general ledger's numbers out of sequence or any of that sort of stuff, give us a call. I mean, that, that's what we do for a living. We're accountants here. So we, we do all that stuff for a living and we can help you walk through that process. Um, I'm being told by Carol Merrill, who's off screen here, pointing at a thing that our next webinar is November the 4th, which um, I don't know what day of the week that is, but you can figure it out. And that webinar will be on the topic of direct care charging payroll. So some of what we alluded to today in the budget. And then the 17th, which is two weeks later, um, is the topic is using job costing or contract management software, I'm talking about, to manage detail cost um, reporting for individuals in, um, in self-directed services, also for managing specific contracts if you've got um, funding sources that are contracting to pay for those or um, programs or departments that you might have. We got a question. Is CPE credit being offered and if so how do I submit it? Do we have an answer to this question? Yes. Yep. We do have an answer. And the answer is? Email me. You email Stacy Gold Taylor S, as in Stacy, Gold Taylor, G O L D T A Y L O R, S Gold Taylor at dopkins.com. And we will send you a CPE certificate for one hour CPE. Um, hopefully that answers your question. S G O L D T A Y L O R at dopkins with a P, D O P as in pneumonia, K as in knit, I N S, dopkins.com. Um, it is now precisely one hour, so um, we'll keep uh, everybody on schedule. Um, thank you for all attending, and hope to see you again in two or three weeks, whenever November the 4th is. Thanks very much.